Okay, well, in the interest of time, I think we're going to get started. I'll wait for uh, the folks outside still sort of grabbing their, their desserts. But um, my name is Sarah Ladisla. I'm the co-director uh, and senior fellow here in the Energy and National Security Program at CSIS. Uh, and we're going to have the second panel now on some of the policy implications of the uh, unconventional oil and gas developments that you've seen in the first panel. Uh, discussion, which really was a, a wonderfully rich discussion about what's actually happening out in the market and how transformational that's been from a North American perspective. As Dave and Frank both noted, this is something we spent a lot of the last year focusing on uh, here in the energy program, and really one of, one of the things we wanted to do today was to tee up a discussion about the ways in which those market-based changes um, and this uh, unconventional energy revolution in the United States has been altering um, some of the policy artifacts or sort of the policies we've got in place uh, in the oil and gas sector here in the United States. We don't have enough time to cover all of them. Uh, so we picked two that we thought were particularly important. Um, crude oil exports or molecule laws, as Rusty has just now returned them for us. Uh, and uh, management of the Strategic Petroleum Reserve. And I think one of the things that we, we're trying to do for this panel is, uh, uh, Rusty had very aptly said he's not, a, he's not a policy guy, so we picked some of our favorite kinds of policy people, uh, which are people who used to do this and now don't. And uh, we think it's wonderful because they, they had the responsibility, they have the breadth and the depth of the knowledge that goes with having that kind of responsibility, uh, but now they do it from the outside so they can say way more interesting things. So, uh, without further ado, we're going to have presentations from each and then a bit of a discussion. Uh, and uh, today, joining me is uh, Ted Kastinger, who's a partner at O'Melveny Myers LLP, which is a law firm here in Washington. Uh, used to be general counsel and then deputy secretary of the Department of Commerce here, uh, uh, and uh, has a, a, a very good oversight on uh, sort of the origins of those uh, funny little molecule laws that we were talking about before, especially on the crude oil side. Uh, and then also John Shagus, uh, who's the president of Strategic Petroleum Consulting uh, and used to be uh, the, the deputy assistant secretary of the Petroleum Reserve uh, and knows more about the Strategic Petroleum Reserve than anybody I've ever met. So um, we will start with a presentation on each and then uh, take some questions from the audience. I think we're going to uh, start with Ted. So, thank you. Well, Sarah, thank you, and thank you all for joining us today. This uh, is an incredibly rich uh, subject in more ways than one, uh, and it is intimidating to, to follow uh, Frank and Rusty and that team, and unfortunately, I don't have any moving uh, parts on my slides. Um, and that's consistent with uh, the fact that you know, Rusty's view of the, of the, the world's is, uh, you know, the, the molecule laws. Unfortunately, I am a lawyer, so it's a much more boring uh, recitation of what's out there actually in the statute that, that uh, is so convoluted, uh, as, as a prior panelist uh, so aptly put it, um, but is what policymakers, uh, lawmakers will be looking at as this debate unfolds folds over 2014, as it will. Uh, with that, let me um, uh, just start with <coughs> What's out there? Well, there are quite a number of laws going back a long way that uh, limit ex crude exports of crude oil. Uh, probably the, the, the core, the central piece of this puzzle is the Energy Policy and Conservation Act 1975, enacted in response to the Arab oil embargo. Uh, it is the, the anchor of the 40-year policy we have that establishes a fundamental prohibition on exports of crude oil except in defined circumstances, and we'll talk about those in a minute. There are, however, quite a number of other statutes that come into play that, in one way or the other, contain similar structures of a prohibition uh, with limited uh, ability to export uh, for certain policy reasons. The Mineral Leasing Act applies to <coughs> uh, crude oil transported in pipelines over federal rights of way. Um, Export Administration Act of 1979 is the basic export control and licensing framework administered by the Commerce Department. Uh, the Outer Continental Shelf Lands Act, uh, the Naval Petroleum Reserves Production Act uh, apply to crude oil produced in particular places. There's only one statutory exception, and that is uh, crude oil produced on Alaska's North Slope, transported through the TAPS pipeline uh, 
It may be exported unless the president finds that the exportation of oil is not in the national interest. So it's kind of the reverse presumption of all the other statutes. Again, the combination of all these effectively make U.S. policy and law that you cannot export crude oil, <coughs> including lease condensates, um, although most petroleum products are exportable without restriction. Oops. <clears throat> Got through the presentation faster than I expected. So, uh, <clears throat> so again, the Energy Policy Conservation Act 1975, uh, let's focus on that for a minute. Uh, this is the statutory language. EPCA requires the president to exercise the authority to promulgate a rule prohibiting the export of crude oil and natural gas produced in the United States. No ifs, ands, or buts about that. Um, the president may exempt from that prohibition such crude oil or national, natural gas exports which he determines to be consistent with the national interest and purposes of this chapter. So the one sort of carve out that you look at is a national interest determination. I think it's important to note, and as we'll see uh, here in a minute, uh, as how the rule has been uh, implemented, or the exception has been implemented, that this is a national interest determination. And one of the questions I think that's very important uh, that will be incorporated into the debate as we go forward is, is the national interest only looking at the 50 states or even the lower 48 plus Alaska, <clears throat> assuming Hawaii doesn't uh, strike crude oil uh, anytime soon? Uh, or really should we be looking at this as a North American platform, Canada, the US, and Mexico as what infuses our national interest in this kind of integrated industry uh, so well portrayed in the slides by the participants earlier, panelists earlier. But the statute says national interest. <clears throat> so the president can exempt uh, in the national interest consistent with congressional purposes. Well, what are those purposes? They're right there in the statute. Uh, Congress intended to decrease dependence upon foreign imports, enhance national security, achieve the efficient utilization of scarce resources, and guarantee the availability of domestic energy supplies at prices consumers can afford. And the president must be vigilant to assure that exemptions do not result in greater reliance on imports. Uh, the, the theme here, very much 1975 mindset, is we've got to reduce reliance on imports. <clears throat> and keep that crude oil that we have at home. And then other thing, good things will happen, including uh, lower prices for consumers. All of these, these things will be called into question as a policy debate, given the realities of the market <clears throat> uh, as we go forward. But this is the framework. This is what Congress establishes the purposes, and exemptions are supposed to be consistent with those purposes. So, as I noted earlier, the Commerce Department is the agency that licenses exports of crude oil. Uh, this is done under the framework of the Export Administration Regulations, also known as the EAR. Within the EAR, there's a section on called Short Supply Controls. These are controls placed on exports for uh, reasons of short supply, meaning it's thought that the product produced in the United States is literally not available in enough quantities to satisfy U.S. needs. There are not many things in the EAR that are restricted for export for reasons of short supply. In fact, there are only really two, one of which is western red cedar, and the other is carriages, carriage of horses by sea. So crude oil, horses by sea, and western red cedar are the things the United States believes are in short supply and for which you need an export license. <clears throat> now, the short supply category is uh, relevant in international trade terms because uh, under the WTO, uh, World Trade Organization agreements, our bilateral free trade agreements and others, there generally is an exception for uh, emergency actions taken for reasons of short supply. This is the historic base. I think in the United States, it's seen as more of a national security ex exception to trade. <clears throat> but the framework is it's a short supply control. The next piece of the framework is all exports have to be licensed. <clears throat> you have to go to the Commerce Department 
and get a license. However, <clears throat> the department has articulated in its rules a number of circumstances in which it has what's called a favorable licensing policy. That is, if you fit in one of these boxes, you will get a license. Uh, if you export crude oil from Alaska's Cook Inlet, uh, Canada for cons cons <clears throat> to Canada for consumption or use in Canada. In other words, you're not supposed to pass it through Canada, ex continue ex export the export to Europe or elsewhere. It needs to be refined. Uh, and you see, you see listed. I'm sorry. Yeah. The uh, the other the other exceptions there. Yes, some uh, circumstances from the SPR. Uh, California heavy crude, that's, uh, you know, Elk Hills basically or, or El around uh, there. Uh, foreign origin crude oil where you can demonstrate that the oil is not of U.S. origin and has not been commingled. So query, can you bring heavy crude from Alberta <clears throat> to the Gulf Coast in a pipeline and then ship it right on through, uh, export. If you can show it's not commingled, uh, then you can get a license to do that. Uh, or the last, consistent with findings made by the president under a, an applicable statute, this is North Slope. There is an applicable statute enacted in 1995, 1996. President Clinton made the requisite findings, so uh, that oil can be exported. Uh, <clears throat> in addition, the Commerce Department rule says, Commerce will consider other applications on a case-by-case -case basis proposed transactions must be consistent with the national interest and purposes of the statute. So this is right out of the statute. Uh, <clears throat> again, national purpose, pur uh, national interest, purposes of law. They then give one example of the kind of case-by-case -case transaction they would consider. It's a swap transaction, but you can see it is so circumscribed uh, that not necessarily very easy to meet the criteria here. Um, but with the changing markets, it'll become very interesting to think about some of the, the, these three criteria. The first is direct, the transaction would result in an export that corresponds directly to an import of equal or greater quantity. I inadvertently omitted. <laughs> and equal or better quality. <laughs> so... Uh, Important to think about, as the earliest pan earlier panelists pointed out, the need as we go forward to be, in effect, shipping out light crude, bringing in heavy crude to meet the refinery imbalance. Uh, but that's, you know, you got to, under the current rule, got to be quantity and quality. Uh, second criterion, uh, pretty straightforward. It, you know, the contract would provide for uh, it to be terminated if in a, an emergency. And then the third is the license applicant <clears throat> must demonstrate that there are compelling economic or technological reasons beyond its control that the crude cannot reasonably be marketed in the United States. Obviously a very high hurdle, except that maybe, maybe the market conditions are so changing that in, you, it, we will get to a point before long where a lot of that West Texas light crude, for example, or from the Bakken, literally cannot reasonably be marketed in the United States. There's too much of it, the refineries can't take it. Uh, so, <clears throat> uh, interesting again going forward, this rule was put into place with the expectation, I think there'd be very few license applications that would meet the criteria. Maybe that won't be true going forward. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> what is crude oil? <laughs> you got a much better explanation from Rusty earlier. Uh, we should be thinking about this in you know molecule terms, chemical terms. Unfortunately, we have statutory language to deal with. And this is only part of the definition, but <laughs> it's the first part that is relevant. Mixture of hydrocarbon carbons <clears throat> goes on and on. The point here is passing through surface separating facilities, not been processed through a crude oil distillation tower, included as reconstituted crude petroleum, lease condensate. Very, very important issue, uh, as uh, Rusty and Frank uh, described earlier. Uh, what is lease condensate? What can be done and through a processing process that turns 
what is coming out of these wells into something that is not within this definition. Uh, that is, uh, it's, it, it is inexplicable, really, to draw the line the way it is today. But this is the statute. If what you're producing <coughs> is crude oil or lease condensate, and when you go to the, to, you want to export it, you have to file a, you know, forms with the custom service, the shipper's export declaration, and you have to say what it is and where it fits on the, uh, what number it fits under the harmonized tariff system or the export uh, commodity classification numbers. And there's long lists of those, and you have to declare. And so if you say it's least condensate, you can't, you can't export it unless you go to the Commerce Department and get a license. But if it's, uh, you know, uh, <coughs> NGL, um, then, then you, know, you can export it without a license. Uh, this is the definition. Uh, this is what people will be very focused on uh, in an arbitrage kind of context, as, as Rusty was mentioning, just uh, in other contexts, trying to figure out what to do with this immense amount of product that's showing up on the Gulf Coast and elsewhere. Um, just to note, um, I think many of you are very familiar with the um, policy debate uh, and the changes that went into place over the last three years in the LNG context. The law, the, the fundamental law is the same. It's the Energy Policy Conservation Act of 1975. You'll recall it prohibits exports of crude oil and natural gas <coughs> without the requisite determinations. The process for licensing is quite different. Uh, First of all, it's a different agency. The Department of Energy handles export licenses for natural gas, uh, Commerce Department for crude oil. Uh, a very different process. Uh, the, in, at the Energy Department, as you saw in the LNG context, generally a public process, notice and comment period. Uh, you get project-based licenses. You have a separate administrative proceedings through FERC for site licensing. At the Commerce Department, generally you're talking about a transaction by transaction licensing process, cargo by cargo. It's a confidential process. You know, you don't, uh, <coughs> if, uh, you know, Shell or Exxon or someone wanted to export a cargo of crude oil, it wouldn't be put out for notice and pu public comment. You just apply for a, a license and it would be considered by the Commerce Department. Uh, one fundamental difference was that in 1992, uh, Congress deemed that applications to export LNG from or to nations with which the United States has a free trade agreement are in the public interest and must be granted without modification. So again, the framework under the EPCA was the president must make a national interest determination in order to permit exports. Congress stepped in and said, well, there's one category of natural gas uh, as the slide says LNG, but it's natural gas uh, as well as LNG, you know, LNG, form of natural gas, uh, which we will deem to be in the public interest, and that is if you're shipping to an FTA country. So, for example, the first two LNG terminal license applications that went through, Chenier uh, and um, Freeport, I can't remember, in any event, they were limited to FTA country exports. The Energy Department didn't even go through its normal notice and public comment period. It simply said, it, it, it made a public notice, we got the license application, and we will grant this in 30 days because Congress has said it is in the public interest, uh, read that national interest. <clears throat> but for other applications where the applicants were seeking to export to more than FDA countries, uh, they went through a very prolonged notice of public comment process. That's very, very different than the crude oil situation at Commerce. <clears throat> uh, Frank Sarah had asked me to say, well, if this issue develops as we think it will over 2014, you know, what will policymakers, what will Congress be looking at as options for change? There are many possibilities, you would think, beginning with repeal of, of the 1975 Act that may, may not be in the cards. <clears throat> but you could create a, you know, take the North Slope approach just uh, make it more broad, uh, that is, reverse the presumption, say the president is authorized to permit exports of crude oil, but he's, <clears throat> but he's not required to prohibit those uh, in the national interest. So uh, he could find that we 
generally there'd be a favorable licensing policy unless for circumstances either associated with a particular transaction or economic circumstances, President, Commerce Department makes a decision that it's not in the national interest to permit a particular export. Uh, there is a, you know, the, the LNG natural gas approach, again, uh, you could by legislation create an exception for exports to free trade agreement partners, other trade agreement, uh, I mean, other trade context or national security allies. <coughs> um, we don't have a free trade agreement with Japan, for example, at the moment, uh, but that may be a very important market, not only commercially, but for national security energy policy reasons uh, to permit exports to. We don't have a free trade agreement with Europe uh, either. So there, uh, but of course the NATO countries, Australia, New Zealand, there, there are a lot of ways you can think about uh, at least beginning to carve out situations where exports would be permitted as a favorable licensing matter. <clears throat> it's not necessary to have legislation to do this. That's the next and most important point. This can be done administratively. The, the authority is there. The president can make determinations in the national interest to permit exports in a variety of circumstances if there is the political will to do so. Uh, so you could take the same approach, free trade agreement partners, national security allies, swaps with Mexico. Uh, you can conjure up a, quite a a range of possibilities <coughs> for policy determinations. I just wanted to finish off <coughs> by a, with a couple of slides um, to, to raise a question I'll, I'll get to on the, the second of these two. So this shows crude oil exports before EPCA was enacted in 1975 and after. The statistics, <coughs> and I haven't tried to scrub them in detail at all, um, but I can tell you they're misleading because the export data includes exports to the Virgin Islands, U.S. Virgin Islands from the United States. And what happened after EPCA was enacted in 1975 was that North Slope crude started being produced and it was being sent to the Virgin Islands, to the refinery there. And so exports, it looks like exports leaped hugely despite the fact Congress passed a law saying there could not be any exports of crude oil. So very misleading in that sense. Uh, this may be a little more meaningful. <coughs> um, and what, the point I wanted to show here first was 1995, you see the exception for North Slope uh, exports was enacted. President Clinton made the determination exports were permitted. And for a couple of years, exports went up. And then they fell off the table. <coughs> uh, and then in the last few years, it started going back up again. Um, but I think going to the point of, I think there's a difference between a policy determination that sounds very momentous, that we're gonna permit crude exp oil exports despite 40 years of policy to the contrary, and what the commercial markets actually will, how they'll react. And it could be, as I understand the situation happened in, after uh, 2000, that you know, the, the transportation costs, for example, from uh, Alaska to Japan and South Korea just make it uneconomic in the market to export, even if we were free to do so. Uh, there, so there are a lot of factors that will affect whether or not exports actually occur, even if we change the policy. Uh, and just to give you a sense, almost all exports, they've been going up, but they're all, almost all to Canada. Uh, there's one little shipment there in 2013, shows to, uh, a little exports to China, that got a lot of news last January. Uh, it seems to be, from news reports, that there was simply a cargo of crude oil that was far in origin, came into U.S. port, and was re-exported. Canada is a U.S. export. It was not U.S. origin crude oil. So exports are rising, um, but it's all to Canada right now. So the <clears throat> uh, bottom line is we have a policy that's very ingrained, very complex, convoluted, uh, been in place for 40 years. A lot of political sensitivity around the idea of changing it, but there is no doubt, given the way the market conditions are shifting, that that debate will be joined over the next year. Thank you. And I think in the interest of, uh, of time and having our discussion together, I'm going to go and move to John's presentation. Uh,
Okay, great, thanks. All right. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here today. I, I didn't know whether to stand on the left side of the podium and say, this time everything's going to be different, or on the right side and say, no matter how much things change, <laughs> everything's going to be the same. Um, there's one thing that's sure in my mind, and that is the Strategic Petroleum Reserve is an amazingly powerful tool. It always has been, and I think it will be for a very long time. Uh, Ted kind of teed things up um, by spending a lot of time on the Energy Policy and Conservation Act, uh, which was passed in 1975, and that's where the SPR came from, as we all know, it was a reaction to the, the oil embargoes. Um, and so there are a whole bunch of things that are addressed in that law, and here are some of the issues. Um, they're all still issues today. Um, and of course, you've heard an awful lot this earlier this afternoon about why things are changing, but these things are all still issues, and they will be for a while. Um, now, EPCA, um, Ted listed a few of the things that are in EPCA. When Congress wrote it, there were eight purposes at the start. The two first purposes are granting authority to deal with the International Energy Program and creation of an SPR. Um, I've highlighted the word impact. You know, the reason I did that is because Congress sometimes does things that are brilliant, but they may not know it. Um, EFCA's been around for a long time. It's very, very hard to amend. Uh, I brought a copy. It's a really thick, thick set of laws. And if you want to change it, even though part of it's crazy, it's hard to do because there's some other part of it that you can't change because once you open the, the floodgates, everybody wants to amend 99 aspects of EPCA. So it doesn't get amended very, very often. So some things are, are kind of um, in there for very, very long periods of time. Um, so when immediately after telling you the purposes, they lay out the policy. And they say the policy is substantial quantities may reduce the vulnerability and therefore create a reserve of up to 1 billion barrels. And there are lots and lots of things in there um, about what that should look like. But there are two important parts. One was flexibility. It said write a plan, submit it to Congress as to what this is going to look like. And then two, which I want to address because it's a kind of a hot issue right now, is regional refined petroleum product reserves. And what that, that law said um, was you will have these things unless you have various reasons not to, to do it. And those reasons were you can substitute crude oil for refined products, um, even though it's called for, if it can be justified on cost. Um, and you will have regional reserves, but you can substitute you can put those things into central storage if you can say we can actually get the things to where they're needed. So right after the law was passed, which was December 1975, uh, they entered into an amazingly um, large and complicated process of developing this plan. And the plan essentially came out, and after studying it like crazy, said central and make it all crude oil. And the reasons are that we have an amazingly robust system, pipelines, shipping, um, and consequently, we can get the refined products to where they need to be in the event of an emergency. And secondly, when you start comparing things, um, there's no comparison between building surface storage, um, steel tanks for putting refined products, which is what you have to do in the Northeast and, and up in the Gulf Coast, and developing salt dome storage down in the Gulf Coast. I, I'm not going to address the technology of actually storing crude oil. I think most of you know a little bit about it. But, but the uh, costs are unbelievable because the size of the caverns is, that you build inside salt domes is so large that the uh, incremental costs get very, very low. Uh, just to illustrate that, if you go and you look at the budget for next year, and, you see, and of course, there are about 700 million barrels of oil in the reserve. You go and look at the budget request for maintaining that. It's, it works out to uh, a little less than 30 cents a barrel for oil actually in the ground. There's also a 1 million barrel, what they call a Northeast Home Heating Oil Reserve, which is actually ultra-low sulfur diesel. 
the budget request for that is $8 million. So you're talking about $8 for the one versus less than 30 cents for the other. Um, and that, that is pretty consistent around the world. Um, and a lot of countries that have sur surface storage, even in very large quantities, pay these astronomical amounts. So that's why back in 76 when they were doing this and they came up with the plan, they said, forget that. And that's the way we went. Um, so you, you ended up with these, what today is four immense sites down on the Gulf Coast. Okay? And, they're, and they, uh, they have 700 million barrels roughly in there. So, but there have always been the idea of competing priorities. And EPCA has been amended. And um, various bits of EPCA, in effect, were amended within appropriations acts because they said SPR must do this or must not do that. Um, and there are the few that are, are really um, constantly competing are energy security. And when you read EPCA at the beginning, it's very clear. Everybody has 1973, 74 embargoes on their minds. We're talking about physical oil. Got to be able to get it to places. Um, and then they talk about market impacts. Um, and at some points they say, um, well, we don't want to have an impact. And other points we say we do want to have an impact. Um, then you've got, of course, the question of how much is it going to cost? And, you know, do you have, um, is it important whether it costs? And, and that changes constantly. Uh, sometimes it's important, sometimes it isn't. Um, so I'm going to spend my, most of my time dealing with this and the next graph. So um, essentially, it boils down to uh, three different things. You had Congress authorizing legislation, or authorizing various reserve sizes by amend amendments to EPCA, and by changes to the SPR plan, which I mentioned earlier. So um, originally, the first plan said go to 500 million barrels, and then we'll figure out what to do. Later, 750, and then later to a billion. Now, um, of course, everybody was in a real, real, real rush. Let's get, let's get this going. Let's build the facilities as fast as we can, acquire existing facilities from the private sector, and start filling. So you can see uh, the incredible ramping up that occurred right beginning in 1977, as soon as we acquired existing facilities from the private sector. Um, once we got going, you can see that we were filling just as fast as we uh, could develop facilities. Um, and then we went into a period where, where we didn't fill at all. I'm going to change to the next slide um, because this is the really, really interesting part where these, this tug of war goes on between the various priorities. So you go back to the beginning. We're talking 1977, 78. Um, uh, and so you've got, you got the Carter administration. And the Carter administration has just been handed off this thing and say, let's go, let's start filling. And so you get a pretty good fill rate, you know, over 150,000 barrels a day. And then, bam, you know, you, you, get, you get hit uh, with the Iranian situation. So, man, prices go crazy. Um, and the administration says, well, cut back. In addition to that, you've got a problem of international affairs, which comes creeping in, because the Saudis weren't real wild about this existing. So there's pressure on the administration not to do it. So things got scaled back pretty dramatically during the Iranian situation. So now you come up to 1981, the Reagan administration comes in. It's still 180 degree. Reagan administration says, this is not only energy security, this is national security. We don't care what it costs, fill it. So all of a sudden, you can see the, the bar charts beginning there in 1981. Um, and oh, yeah, we had a little conflict with budget because, of course, the idea is, you know, don't, don't want to drive the budget up. So there was a guy, some of you may remember, or a certain age, uh, David Stockman. And he, he was over at OMB at the time. He said, well, how can we come up with all the money to do that and at the same time not send up big big budget deficits. Well, easy. Let's say what we're doing is acquiring resources. Let's take this whole thing off budget. So for a period of time, every budget that went up simply said, we want a bunch of money, but it doesn't show as part of the budget. So we were 
we were appropriating billions and billions and billions of dollars, but it didn't show up as part of the budget, although naturally it did add to the deficit. So, so if you look at the totals, and I'm going to go back just one slide, and you can see that most of the oil that we have in the Strategic Petroleum Reserve today went into that reserve during the first five years of the Reagan administration. Okay. So back. So that went on for a period of about five years, and, um, and then they said, whoa, you know, deficit's really, really, really getting kind of out of control here. So maybe we should cut back. So they started cutting back. And, um, and, you know, it slowed down a little bit. And then along comes the Bush administration. And, you know, they get hit pretty early on with the Iraq uh, invasion, which they call for. So, so what do they do? They say, well, obviously, you're not going to fill. You know, we got this problem. But did they draw down? No, they didn't draw down right away. Well, why didn't they draw down right away? Well, there's a lot of nail biting going on because Maybe we don't have enough. This thing could get a lot worse. When they attack the Saudis, we may need all we can get, so let's not draw down right away. So they don't draw down right away. And then January comes along, and we invade Iraq. Well, we had an agreement with the IEA that we're going to draw down, so we all draw down. Well, first day, the war is over. Well, what do we do? Well, we drew down anyway. Well, why did we draw down? Well, because there was a lot of concern that since there was an international agreement, we needed to draw down because otherwise the IEA would fall apart. So we sold a bunch of oil, even though the price we sold it at was less than we just paid for the oil that we'd been buying willy-nilly, regardless of price, the previous five years. But that's okay. So we had a few conflicts going on there, and it changed all the time. So you go through the Bush administration, and now you come along to Clinton. Well, Clinton's administration, at the beginning, they could care less. You know, we're, we're, not, we're not, not dealing with fossil energy anymore. We're going into the new future, renewables, blah, 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 blah. So nothing happens for a few years. Um, but then um, we needed some extra money. We were going to decommission Weeks Island. So I said, well, man, you know, our highest priority is balancing the budget. How are we going to do that? So what do they say is sell $100 million worth of oil to decommission Weeks Island. So you can see on there that we sold 100 million barrels of oil. And all of a sudden, people said, whoa, this stuff is fungible. We can turn it into money. So then we had this, we had three more appropriations bills that said sell oil, you know, just for budget balancing purposes. We gave some money to the Department of Education. You know, so all of a sudden, why have we got this thing? Well, it's to balance the budget. But then what happened? Oh, 1997, 1998, 99 come along. And you got the Asian financial collapse. So they'd already passed appropriations bills saying, let's sell a bunch of oil to raise money. Well, but guess what happened? The price of oil went boom. It went down to $10 a barrel. And you got a whole bunch of stripper well people saying, man, we're dying here. We can't, you know, we can't come up with a marginal value of our barrel to repair the pumps that's bringing out our stripper well oil, and you guys are selling oil? So Congress rushes, and they pass an emergency supplemental appropriation bill to say to the president, you don't have to sell the oil we commanded you to sell as part of the appropriations bill. That was kind of interesting. Um, so, so we stopped. And now what happens is we're still in the crunch. You know, the oil prices are horrible, and industry is getting crushed, an energy security issue. So it was Secretary Richardson, he formed an emergency oil task force. And what was it, what was it all about? It was how can we help the industry? How can we stop shutting in large reserves of oil? And the answer was, well, geez, we just sold 28 million barrels of oil to raise money. Let's put 28 million barrels of oil back in. We can create some artificial demand. So all of a sudden it changed from the budget's the most important thing to energy security is the most important thing. It took us a while, but the reason we had a royalty and kind program out of the Department of the Interior is because we pushed hard enough for it to come up with the ability to transfer oil from Interior's royalty oil to the Department of Energy without affecting the budget request. So again, uh, a change, you know, 
this, that, tug of war. So, um, and then of course, the Clinton administration kind of got focused on it and said, what can we do? And you had a, um, you had a very large real market intervention in 2000. And you can see that, it was 30 million barrels. It was an exchange, though. It wasn't a sale, it was an exchange. And without getting into the details of that, it was for one purpose, drive down the price of crude oil. Why? To make it even more profitable for refiners at the time to keep up their utilization rate, to create, to increase the volume of heating oil in the market. And that was a reaction to a shortage of heating oil in early 2000. So all of a sudden, you're going another different direction. Incredible flexibility in a tool for which Congress, way back in 1975, just thought energy security molecules or international obligations. So um, that, that administration ends, and you come in, and you get the, uh, the Reagan administration. I, I, uh, yes, I'm sorry, the Reagan administration. So back to, I'm sorry. Bush administration, <laughs> slipping, Bush administration. Bush administration gets confronted with 2000, uh, I mean, September 11th. So what do they say? Man, we're back to the Reagan years. This thing is national security and energy security. Fill it, <laughs> budget be damned. So we're off to the races again. And you can see what the, what's going on there. And that was an amazing period of time because you actually had for the first time in my recollection, um, people in the Congress and the administration on opposite sides of this thing because it becomes clear to them what, what's going on. So when it gets to 2008, we're still filling, um, the administration's position was, we're not going to do things because of price. So we're going to keep filling. Well, we're into a recession. The uh, price of oil is going to $147 a barrel and we're still filling. And the Congress comes along and says, you guys are nuts, you're affecting the economy. So they passed a legislation that said, unless you go, uh, you will not fill anymore unless the price of crude oil goes to below $75 a barrel. Okay, so one side is saying money, effect on the economy, the other side is saying national security. Um, and it you know, goes on and on and on like that. And of course, then you get to the current administration, which is, until very recently, not focused on uh, fossil energy at all. If anything, it's being treated as a negative. And, um, and so it just wasn't an issue. But we know, because you've got a new secretary over there, Ernie Moniz, who understands the SPR, and uh, his head of policy, Melanie Kinderdine, they're, going, they're pushing for, and there's going to be a quadrennial energy review in which this, this type of stuff is going to get looked at. Um, and so we'll, we'll see what, what happens. But that's kind of, the idea is this thing is flexible. It can be used for whatever an administration wants or whatever a Congress wants. Um, and, and, well, I'll save that for a moment. So um, now, just done with that, but one of the key things that everybody focuses on, and this is a crappy, Metric, absolutely terrible, but it's 90 days of imports. And the reason everybody looks at 90 days of imports is because it's part of the IEA charter. Every member will have 90 days of imports. And so right from the start, you know, we were trying for that and um, never really had it um, until now. In 2012, we were right at 90, and I showed 2013 on here, but that's year to date. But we're well above, you know, we're looking at 105 days. So the International Energy Agency is fine, you know, we've got that covered. Question is, is it meaningful? And um, my, my argument will always be no, not, not terribly meaningful. Um, Uh-oh, I don't know what happened. But, um, okay, so, um, and well, and the reason, well, let me just stay with that for one second. And the reason it's not terribly meaningful is because what this program is really morphed into is protection of the economy. It's not actual barrels, it's not molecules. The question is, if you have a huge price spike, will you be able to suppress it enough to keep the economy going 
And on the flip side, if you have a tremendous crash in the oil price, can you buy oil and fill the reserve fast enough to prevent your energy security in terms of domestic production from going away? And that's, that's the last one. Now this, unfortunately, um, I don't know why it didn't show up, but anyway, those, those spots show um, where ex oil is exported from. Now, the, uh, in 2011, we had a, we had a drawdown um, for the Libyan situation. It was 30 million barrels. And because of everything you heard earlier in the afternoon, you can't move oil up the pipelines the way you used to. So a big, big chunk of that oil went over the water to various places. And what this is, what this is showing is where the oil left, how it left the three major spots, West, uh, West Hackberry, Big Hill, and Bryan Mound, it was put on tankers or barges and moved around to the rest of the sites or other points of uh, use on the Gulf Coast, and then all the way around to New England. Um, and I think we'll have some questions about that, so I won't, won't dwell on it for very long. But that is really the future. If the pipelines aren't available to take this oil inland anymore, the future is going to mean putting that oil on the water. Um, and um, so the question is, and this was raised by Ed Morris, for those of you who found him, can you move this amount of oil? And this was done, again, this is a DOE graphic. And the question is, yeah, it depends. It depends on the situation. And essentially what this boils down to is if it's a huge, huge world disruption, then, yeah, you're going to get shorted enough oil that's going to be coming over the water anyway that you can feed it into the U.S. economy. If the disruption is small, you can't do it. And you can see how that this, this is no revelation. If you go back and you look at the the drawdown um, that occurred 2011, I'm sorry, in 2011, because of the Libyan situation, there was no need for that oil into the U.S. market, and they had a hard time, uh, they had a hard time selling it. And in fact, a lot of other times, we've had a lot hard time selling the oil. Even in the case of Katrina, there was no, uh, in 2005, there was no need at all because all the refineries were knocked out you know, practically underwater. So we drew down oil anyway because it was a quid pro quo to get the Europeans to release their stocks of refined products, which then came pouring into our East Coast. So, so this is not a new thing. Um, and whether, whether we adjust to it or not is, uh, is going to be a major policy issue. So I think, I think that's it, isn't it? So, Thank you. Yeah. Well, thank you both for those, those fantastic presentations. The good news is we have a good bit of time for, uh, for questions. I'm going to start off while, we, while the audience sort of thinks about some of their questions, because one of the things um, that's interesting about policy is that it usually has something to do with politics. And so I, you, both of your presentations were very heavy on, uh, John, I think you, you, you certainly focused on some of the political dynamics around the use of the SPR. But Ted, I thought maybe I might try and sort of uh, get your thoughts on what is the political nature of crude oil exports? Because I think we've been privy to a, a bunch of discussions that say, yes, it is very political, or no, it is not very political. And, and certainly what we've seen with the natural gas export discussion, that has been a, a hyper-political discussion, but, but its nature is a little bit more public. So could you talk a little bit about the politics of the crude oil exports? Uh, sure, Sarah. Um, I think the first observation I'd make is it's not a political party issue. Uh, <clears throat> like, it, I think there are two components to the crude oil debate that uh, have, have been there for a long time and we'll see for long, going forward. The first is the national security debate, uh, and it's deeply embedded in the experience of the Arab oil embargo. And there are people who uh, will think that, and do think, that the energy renaissance is a fantastic thing in the United States, and why don't we keep it all? Um, uh, so uh, it, it is very hard, I think, for a lot of people to uh, see beyond the fact that we have this wonderful wealth of resources to the point that actually it may make most sense, uh, as it often does, to have a free market in the product to uh, 
balance the various needs of the economy in the best way. So, for example, to get the refinery balance you need to actually encourage production to sustain the security point. Those are, uh, so I think there's a national security side uh, that's deeply embedded. The other is the most prosaic uh, and historic of issues, and that is gasoline prices. You know, what are consumers going to pay? So the LNG debate is very different. Uh, that has been controversial uh, in large part to the extent there has been controversy driven by industrial users of gas and the argument that we should be maximizing the accessibility of that gas at home to continue to foster the manufacturing renaissance in the United States, which is very important. Uh, issue, but whether you need to restrict exports is a different question. Um, crude oil is not particularly used uh, uh, in terms of refining to, you know, on the, the manufacturing side. It is a direct relationship to gasoline prices. I think what you'll find most economists saying is that it had the exports of crude oil will have no impact or very little on domestic gasoline prices, which are set by the price of Brent. It's a world market in gasoline. Uh, and so we export more or less, it's not going to affect prices at the pump, but there is a deep fear that that will occur. Yeah. And just to follow up on that, you would, you'd mentioned sort of the confidential nature of the, the licensing process that happens at Commerce. Why is that process confidential and, for example, the export permit process at, at the Department of Energy public? Uh, good question. The, 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 Historic root of the Commerce Department export regulations is uh, a transaction by transaction permitting process that is regarded as a confidential business matter, uh, and so uh, it's it's uh, just that's the whole framework of the commerce licensing process. <coughs> um, the the gas uh, has been a DOE issue, and again, you're talking about large projects, and what was a fundamental national interest determination of broad scope. Even in the crude oil side, the president has published determinations, for example, on Cook Inlet oil or North Slope, uh, not with a particular you know, notice and public comment process, but at least the overall policy decision was published. But what will be happening and what is happening at Commerce on the exports to Canada is people go in transaction by transaction, and you know it's confidential business information. They've got a deal. They want a license. And that's not, you know, that's just not been subject to uh, public scrutiny. If there is a larger national interest determination uh, to broaden the scope of exemptions under the Commerce Rules, we may well see a notice and public comment process. Do you think that's likely to happen? Uh, I think the debate is going to be joined. Uh, and, it, you know, we may sort of get there falling backwards. Uh, there'll be as, as indicated by earlier panels today, there's going to be so much crude out there looking for a home. People will start looking for uh, ways to uh, export. The, uh, the, we, you know, we are, by the way, we are exporting crude today, right? It's just in the form of, of refined products. So you just kind of move up the chain, what's least condensate, what's not. You'll start getting a lot of those. Um, and at some point, I think the administration or, and or Congress will uh, square up to the issue that we need to have a consistent policy uh, and that probably will, the debate will be joined. And John, just quickly for you, I, I, there, uh, one sort of a, a, a more glib question and then, and then another a little bit more technical, but um, uh, should I take from your history of how we've used the SPR, which you've rightly sort of accounted as a, a, a wonderful and amazing tool, um, as Democrats like money, Republicans like security? And if that is true, it, do you think that that sort of, sort of binary dynamic will hold going, going forward? And then I think the second one is you, you, you ended on a point where I think a lot of people access this conversation these days, which is the physical infrastructure in the United States and maybe the refining complex itself is changing. And so does that fundamentally change the utility of the SPR in any way because of our inability to use it the way that, that, that we used to, and, and how seriously do you take those conversations? Well, let me deal with the glib one first. That's easier, I guess. The, the answer is no, I think everybody wants energy security. Uh, there's no question at all about that. It's just a slightly different perspective. And, and um, so 
you know, if you talk, if you go down and you talk with the various people in different parts of DOE these days, you know, you get, you have uh, two. <laughs> it comes out. I, I analogize them to rapturous. You know, things are going to happen. So I can, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to ascend into heaven, and so I can sell my house and give away the money, and um, and so you can go and find people who say the electric car is coming, there's no question at all between electric cars and plug-in hybrids and super high mileage cars coming out of the cafe standards. The oil days are numbered, you know, forget oil, you know, so you got that and, um, and, and also we're going to go and put all the money, we're going to take the money and put it into renewables. So oil can go away. We want energy security, but We've got the roadmap. You don't, you don't need that stuff anymore. Um, some of us tend to say, well, let's don't, not sell the house and give away the money until it actually happens. And um, it's cheap insurance. And, and um, on that side, but on the other side, the Republicans um, tend to have said, yeah, you know, we really like that security, but in order to get the benefits of it, you, you have to actually use it. So, the Bush administration was, was sort of of two minds. They really, really, really wanted a larger reserve. They wanted to fill what we had. They wanted to go to a billion barrels. Actually, very little remembered, but they actually wanted, at the end, they put out a policy statement saying go to a billion and a half. And uh, so they really, really, really wanted that, but it was hellacious trying to get them to use it. Um, and so you had a lot. And you know you had situations where the like in Venezuela you had the Venezuela uh, strike, and we were really getting tight. You had a lot of people on the Gulf Coast saying, since it's in our backyard, this is ours. You, you didn't have that release, and also you had the uh, you know again the 2008 situation where um, it was pretty clear to me that if you look at the economics. Uh, the recession was going on, that you really should be doing something about $147 oil because it was creating a tremendous headwind toward, for the economy, but instead of actually drawing down, which I would have done just for price purposes at the time, we were filling. And the thought was, we don't do things for price purposes, so we're not going to stop filling. Um, but that's not, in my mind, energy security, because if you devastate the economy, that's not, that's not what it's all about. So, uh, so on that side. Now, the, um, the infrastructure issues are extremely interesting. Yeah, I, I, uh, I think several things ought to be done. Uh, I think some sort of provision ought to be made at this point for refined products. Because the Hurricane Katrina thing showed that certain segments of the country really, really had a problem. You know, if you look at the area around Atlanta, um, nothing has changed. They're pretty much dependent on one pipeline bringing all their stuff. They almost ran out of fuel in Atlanta in 2005. Um, it didn't make any difference that we had a lot of uh, refineries. They were underwater. You know, the pipelines didn't have electricity. They had an electricity failure to the pipeline, so it just didn't make any difference where it was. So I think you, you need it. And you have to have it out of reach of the... Uh, of the uh, hurricanes that are more, most likely going to be hitting heavy. So you, you have that. And then the question of how to distribute, which comes down again to Ted's uh, area of expertise. In my mind, if, if we know where we're going to be, if Congress debates this, leaves the law the same, saying you're not going to be able to export crude, then you better ha make some other changes um, because more and more of the oil from the SPR, when it's called for, is going to have to go over the water. It's not going to go up the pipelines because the pipelines are all being reversed and they're all going down to the Gulf. And so something needs to be done. And, um, you know, either there'll be, and of course there'll be more docks for exporting, but the Jones Act will get in the way. And so you need to deal with those kinds of things uh, to make it work. But essentially, the problems uh, are, are more policy problems than they are physical problems, I think, because I do think there'll be a lot of dockage built to handle all these exports that we're talking about. Great. We'll take some questions now from the audience. We've got one over there. <laughs> 
I'm Michael Leahy with the Energy Information Administration. Uh, Ted, I wanted to ask you, as you've discussed, that U.S. refiners are exporting record levels of products because they can't export the crude, and uh, or the U.S. can't export the crude. And I'm wondering, under the WTO, as you talked about, one of the effects of U.S. exports has been European refiners getting hit uh, rather hard because they can't compete on price. And as they start to close, there's been some rumblings about bringing a WTO case against the U.S. because of artificially uh, priced crude. Is that something that you think legally they would have a case, and how might that play out? Uh, it's a great question. Um, <clears throat> so uh, just brief, brief framework on that. Uh, you know, the WTO agreements uh, generally intended to foster uh, free trade, and they're there are exceptions, um, well, and, uh, there are, and there are exceptions that countries can call on to uh, justify derogations from their obligations. One is short supply. Uh, another is national security. So uh, historically, the U.S. has relied on the short supply exemption, and as the world's largest importer, uh, not, not very hard to do, and, and given the percent of consumption. And that's still true today. So how would it play out? I, you know, a little hard to see European countries initiating a, a complaint in the WTO against the U.S. for this reason. Um, if it happened, it would take years to play out. I can't imagine that any administration uh, would not defend uh, that uh, it, the U.S. position against uh, in, in a dispute of, of that kind. Um, it raises all kinds of domestic trade policy issues uh, that, you know, are totally aside from the crude oil debate. but. Uh, you know the the role of Congress, uh, the, you know the primary uh, constitutional authority over international trade, and the, the way that con executive and congressional branches interact with one another on trade issues. The notion that somehow the U.S. has given away this 40-year-old embedded policy under trade agreements. You know, I just think there'd be a tremendous domestic political reaction against just kind of throwing up our hands and saying, "Oh yes." Uh, you know, we, we, it's not in short supply anymore, and we're wrong, and we, you know, we're going to change the policy. So that's one set of issues. The other, is, without being too, <laughs> too arcane about this in w, uh, trade law uh, context, I, I think the United States would assert a national security defense. Um, the U.S. position in the in the World Trade Organization is that a the assertion of a national security exception is unreviewable. That, that is, the U.S. wouldn't even show up for a dispute to talk about it. Uh, this is the position the U.S. has taken in a, in a series of contexts over both uh, Republican and Democratic administrations since the GATT and at the end of World War II. Um, so uh, the U.S. position, I think, would be uh, this is, you know, we're heavily relying on imports still. Uh, it's a fundamental national security matter in, you know, uh, how we deal with our uh, energy trade. And we're not going to talk about it. That's how I think it would play out. Question? I can't see over on that side of the room. You know, one of the other. Oh, go ahead, please. Eric Swenson with the. Your your comments focused on the vast difference in policy between natural gas exports to free trade agreement countries and crude oil exports. And I'm just wondering, you know, how big do you judge the gulf to be between the U.S. policy with respect to um, non-free trade agreement countries for natural gas or LNG, where there's a presumption that's rebuttable in favor of exports, that is, you have to show it's inconsistent with the public interest in order to block it, as opposed to what I take your comments on crude is, you've got to show that it is consistent with the public interest in order to export crude. Right, so, uh, you know, that is the, the current framework today. Um, you know, the, the presumption for natural gas was enacted really, you know, right at the same time NAFTA came into effect. So we had a free trade agreement with Canada from back 1985 that provided for, you know, uh, free trade rules on in energy, and you can, can see in 1992, uh, NAFTA just finished negotiate, being negotiated. Uh, you know, I think the provision was put in uh, 
uh, to deal pr principally with Canada, but also Mexico at the time, creating, reversing the presumption. Uh, it was, wasn't done for crude. Uh, you know, I think probably wasn't a particular economic issue at the time, but also uh, pretty sensitive from a national security standpoint. Um, I, you know, I, I think the, the the same dynamic that drove the three, last three years of the policy review uh, that resulted in now a consistent set of permits being granted in the LNG area for non-free trade agreement countries as well as free trade agreement countries should drive the crude oil debate too. Uh, uh, <clears throat> it's just, uh, you know, it's uh, not the, we're not there yet on the framework. Um, you know, the, the administration could, um, using its administrative authority, make that national interest determination. And they may do it incrementally. Um, uh, let me, you know, there are a couple things going out there that are, could be real variables in the short term. Iran is one. You know, uh, we all hope things go well uh, there, but if, if they don't, there'll be tremendous pressure to tighten sanctions even more. Our allies in, in Korea and Japan are, you know, going to be looking to us probably to help support uh, and avoid these sanctions that, uh, you know, could come into play, the secondary sanctions. So, there are a lot of national security variables that are important to crude oil. It's somewhat of a different market in terms of downstream uses and you know, how much Japan or Korea would take. But um, I, the, the overall fact that we're becoming a net exporter and we need to export for our own reasons to get refinery balance and to actually sustain the production curve is, I think, pretty compelling. One of the things that we do, in addition to trying to put really smart people in front of you to talk about interesting issues, is get you out of here on time. And so uh, we've just about run up to our, our wall. I want to thank uh, John and Ted and our earlier panelists uh, for a great discussion, and please join me in thanking them for all their thoughts. <laughs>